So you're probably good friends with uh Yeah. Welcome back to the Side by Side Guys Off-Road Podcast. I'm Big Z, and today we are joined by some special guests from down south. You've all kind of hit us up to keep integrating more East Coast and down south uh, brands and identities, and we're doing that today, bringing on board a well-established, well-known brand when we talk about mudding. It's kind of synonymous with that mudding scene, and uh, today we are uh, joined by some special guests. We are, are honored to have Scott and Rachel Smith from High Lifter uh, down in Louisiana. How are you guys doing? Great. Doing great. Glad to be invited. That's right. Yeah, I'm super stoked to be able to talk with you guys and learn a little bit more about your story and kind of what you guys are doing and where you're headed. Um, kind of give us an introduction to who you guys are and uh, what you guys are doing down there. All right. Well, I'm Scott Smith from High Lifter. Uh, been at this racket for right at 25 years. This year. Uh, yeah, 25 years this year. And uh, so we kind of helped uh, kickstart a lot of this. And uh and just having having fun still after 25 years, it feels like we're just getting started. Definitely the OGs. <laughs> so you guys have been around uh, since the basically before UTVs were really a thing, right? Like you guys started down on quads, I think, on uh, little Hondas, right? Yep, we all started out on Hondas down here, and uh, there were no side by sides. Um, not that anybody rode recreationally, anyway. And uh, so we started off with lift kits and tires and wheels and and all that that sort of thing for ATVs and of course when the side by sides came on scene uh it was it was a longer transition than you would have thought uh it feels like it happened overnight but it really didn't it was it was gosh 10 it was a good 10 year 12 year transformation before it got as big as it is now but uh we made that transition but we still do a lot of stuff for ATVs so I think a lot of people don't realize the whole business part of things. They think businesses just pop up overnight and all of a sudden they have products to offer and, you know, all, they're kind of just going by the, the seat of their pants. I think that people don't realize that it takes quite a bit of time to develop it uh, for one, a brand, two, a following, three, a quality product set and uh, establish yourself as a leader in an industry. It doesn't just happen with social media. We just see people pop up and disappear and, and all this other stuff, right? We're used to seeing that, but it takes quite a bit of effort and time uh, to, to, to establish a well foundation to business that can sustain itself through highs and lows, right? Yeah, you know, it's funny. My dad always says, well, son, if it was easy, everybody would do it. <laughs> and so, uh, you know, it, and, and that's true because... You know, making cool stuff is literally the easiest thing we do. You know, there's so many people that can make cool stuff. I mean, I love getting online and you see smaller shops or backyard mechanics and they're coming up. I mean, with stuff that is like amazing. Works and, of art. Yeah, yeah. Works of art. That you, right. They're so impressive. And, you know, that part is, is, of course, that's the part I love and was so much fun. But the deal is to transition that into a business with a customer base and, and all the things that you have to do, that's the hard part. And I'm telling you what, it is hard. Uh, we, uh, we, you know, we struggle with fulfillment. I wish that we can make three times what we make now, you know, but the reality is from concept to design, to manufacture, to test, to, you know, redo, it just takes a long time. And people are like, well, man, can't you just do such and such? It, it, it don't take that much time. I'm like, it really doesn't take much time. That is the easy <laughs> part. It's all the other stuff that uh, that's complicated and uh, it takes all the time. But we're working on improving that daily. Oh, yeah. I mean, we're doing all kind of stuff. I mean, we're working on moving headquarters into a new facility. Um, we'll have more room for inventory. We'll have more manufacturing. You know, we'll have... We'll just have so much more capacity. Um, right, you're scaling up the time. business, right? Every every season of the business has a scale effect, and and you're at that point where it's physical now. You got to actually outgrow those walls and, and move into a place that enables you to do more. Yeah. So we started. We needed to be scaled up about eighteen months ago. Um, and matter of fact, we bought a building eighteen months ago, and we were getting ready to move in it. And then, of course, COVID hit, and everything got put on hold. And then, you know, of course, it's everybody. Not a, it's not a fast transition to go from one massive facility to another, for sure. No, no, it is. It is very, very time consuming and expensive and all those other things. 
that you really got to do it right when you're talking about moving headquarters. So let's uh, talk a little bit about where you came from, right? Like this started with, uh, I believe, you and your dad, right? It originally started, my dad, uh, he had a Honda 400, right? And uh, it had no ground clearance. It came stock with 24-inch tires, um, a few inches of uh, wheel travel, wasn't much. And uh, Interco, um, shout out to Super Swampers, first of all. <laughs> uh, they came out with a 26-inch Super Swamper, and it was – it was the tire of tires. If you like mud riding, you had to have this tire. So the Honda, there's no way you could put this tire on a Honda. So my dad's like, can you do a lift kit? And I was a shade tree mechanic, you know, and I was like, well, absolutely. So I, I welded one on and he put those tires on and everybody saw it where we ride. And they're like, man, that's, that's cool. You know, I don't want to weld it on. So we played around with a, a bolt on kit and, and finally got it. And, uh, and then the, the next year was really interesting. We went from me making it to subcontracting it out to me making it. And uh, a lot of struggles back then getting that figured out. Uh, but the original high lifter shop, listen to what I'm telling you, all right? <laughs> Seven feet wide, 12 feet long. That's my, that's my podcast ago. studio. <laughs> yeah, so like, and it was, it was before UTV. So whenever I would work on a four-wheeler, I would pull the front half in and work on it. Then I would turn it around and put the back in right. and work on it. That's when it's cold. When it wasn't cold, you just had to work out under an awning, <laughs> you know? Right. So, uh, so high lifter truly had the most humble beginnings that a company could ever have. And, you know, you know, I would challenge anybody to have a smaller shop than tw a seven by 12. It wasn't even called high lifter at that point. Right. That was still just kind of a, by the evening. That was just type that was Scott and dad. Yeah. <laughs> Scott and dad. And, uh, yeah. Dad named it high lifter probably within four or five months. I mean, once we kind of like, Hey, we're kind of on to something here. Uh, we went ahead and, and formed a business and officially named it high lifter. And, uh, By we that both time, had I'm sure you had lots of local support starting to build around the idea that you were making these products. Fun story is he, he started selling these brackets in the thrifty nickel. Yeah, like the penny saver, thirty nickel, stuff like that. And, gotcha. Uh, and so how uh, did that work out? Did that, did that turn into sales for you or was that more of like just a localized growth thing and then and then you had to grow out of it? No, it was it was uh, just an interim to test, you know. So every week I'd place my fifteen ads in the various regions in the south to you see what we did and you know, our, our real big break was uh, Dirt Wheels Magazine. Um, you know, Dirt Wheels, you know, particularly at the time, was like the Bible of ATV. Right. You know, they've been around. Anybody that was anything to do with ATV read this thing cover to cover, word for word. Um, I gave them a call one day, just sitting at my desk. Uh, at the time, I was a general contractor. And I was like, I'm going to call them. So I called them, got the editor on the phone, Dennis Cox. Dennis Ketchup Cox and uh, got it and, and told him about what I had. He said, well, uh, that sounds really interesting, Scott. He said, send me one. I said, absolutely not. <laughs> not, not a chance in, in heck. So uh, I said, you got to come here. So, he, so we worked it out. He got on a plane, flew to Louisiana. We took him on a weekend of riding. And uh, he wrote a phenomenal article about this lift kit that is now available for an ATV that nobody really even knew what the heck it was, you know. And uh, he gave us a cover photograph, a five or six page spread. Wow. And that's when the phone started ringing. Right. And uh, that's kind of that's that was the real takeoff. Been ringing ever since. <laughs> yeah, been ringing ever since. You know, when you talk about starting off with that initial product, what took you from having that one product that was starting to push, you know, you forward to then having to realize you have other products to make as well. Uh, well, originally, you know, interestingly enough, the very first product we had was a two inch lift kit for, I actually think we, it was an inch and a half back then. Maybe it was either an inch and a half or two inches, uh, a front lift for a Honda 400. That was our entire product offering. And then we added the Honda 300 front lift kit and a Big Bear front lift kit. Uh, all those were solid axle, uh, solid rear axles. 
So at first we didn't even make a lift for that, for the rear. Cause it, you know, you weren't getting ground clearance, but pretty soon everybody wanted their bike to sit level and they wanted that tire fender clearance. So we did the back lift kit. And now we have some of these skews. You can't count them all. <laughs> yeah. Nobody has more lift kit skews than us. The, uh, the interesting thing that I found is that, you know, people think that just putting a lift kit on a car uh, solves all your problems that you instantly have all the clearance you need. You instantly have, you know, you're not going to run into things and break things, but ultimately in the end, it's just going to make you want to build more things and, and hit things harder and go faster. And so I'm sure that as you start bolting these things on, right, you're going to start seeing, you know, more issues pop up and more weak points discovered and more uh, needs to fulfill. Like what is that process for you guys when you go to, to say, okay, now we've elevated this product to this level. Now we have, you know, a whole hundred different avenues we can go with it. Where do you start picking your, your battles and how do you start picking new products to build for that, that product set? Well, it starts with we're, we're, we're running led by enthusiasts, you know, me and some of the other guys here at the shop and uh, my wife, Rachel, she, she's an enthusiast. So what it does, the way it's done is, you know, what do we need when we're out riding? What would make this more fun? What would make it more reliable? What would make it perform better? And, and that's where most of our ideas are driven off of, you know, is solving problems that we experience because we, we go and do it, but, you know. We, we, we live it daily. We're not just in here working. We're out there writing too. Yeah. So that, I think that has a lot of benefit for us is that we just love it so much. And I think that the, uh, the Southern uh, community of off-road riders has a, has a, a uni- uniquely formed passion around off-roading that different segments of the country don't have. And I think that people down there, they actually live and breathe, you know, getting out and mudding or on the weekend going to the the waterhole or going, you know, to these places where people can gather and have a community um, experience, right? And so... A lot of camaraderie, yeah. Yeah, absolutely. A lot of camaraderie. So I know you guys have been around the country a lot, right? Doing a lot of different events and things like that. How would you compare the southern mother- mudding scene to, like the Western desert scene or the Duners or the, the Northeastern trail guys, like how does that become unique for you guys? Um, I'm not really sure that it is unique. In in my opinion, everywhere that we, we go and we ride, we kind of run into the same thing. We make friends on the trail, all of our friends out West, all the way up to New Hampshire, um, are, we've all met on the trail out doing that, the same thing. So really, to me, whether I'm riding in the mud, a trail, sand, or rock, it's kind of just the same com- com- camaraderie of like the off-road family. And and that's how I've met some of my best friends is out west, you know, up north, out east, in the south. Um, I kind of think it's the same everywhere. What about you? Yeah, it's interesting. Uh, you were talking about we get to, to get out other parts of the country. So just a couple of weeks ago, right before Snowmageddon, I was out in Glamis. <laughs> Uh, testing a bunch of new out west stuff that we're developing. And, uh, you know, so what we do in the south is we ride for a little while, stop at a mud hole, have a cold drink, and shoot the crap. Right. So go to go, so go to Glamis. And uh, so we, we dune for a little while. We pull up on top of a dune. We sit around, you know, talk. Then we cruise over to a uh, swing set. Right. You know, where there's about 800 people out there just having a good time. And that's comparable to, you know, us being like in a sand pit or something. So it, it's funny that uh, there there are so many similarities. There are some differences in personalities. You know, the South is truly unique just in the way people are down South. <laughs> right. Uh, yeah. When you say yes, ma'am or no, sir, to someone out West, they kind of look at you like you're insulting them. <laughs> down here, it's a respect thing. Right. Yeah, it's, you know, so there's some differences there, but it's really interesting that uh, people just love that that getting together. So uh, you mentioned a little bit about getting out west and and all that. You're you're developing a new product line, but uh, let's first talk a little bit about what the majority of your product line looks like, right? So you have lift kits, you have a arms, you have trailing arms, you've got all sorts of different suspension components. Um, and then you, at some point you got into actually running your own set of tires, right? Like how did that evolve? Cause the tire world's a completely different world than manufacturing, you know, a tie rod or a, an arm link. Right. Yeah. Yeah. So it's actually a fun story. Um, and it, and it goes back to the very, very early years of high lifter. I mean, you know, 
we were still kind of a nobody when we designed the outlaw tire. Uh, actually, my dad designed the very first outlaw tire at the kitchen table, uh, cutting out patterns and pasting them together on bigger sheets. I mean, it's it was the lowest tech thing that you could possibly have. <laughs> a true right? paper I mean, napkin story, yeah. It's a true paper napkin story, and uh, so my my granddad owned a tire company in Monroe, Louisiana. He owned a tire distributorship, and and through that tire distributorship. Uh, which was then taken over by my uncle. Uh, they made really, really good friends with Gateway Tire gotcha. uh, uh, out of out of uh, North Mississippi. And so because of that relationship, we called them and said, hey, you know, y'all are this massive tire company because Gateway, you know, they you know, the buckshot mutter. I mean, that's, I mean, everybody in mud knows what the buckshot mutter is. You know, this is Gateway's roots. So we talked to them, we said, hey, you want to do a tire together? And they're like, sounds great to us. We love doing stuff. Right. And so, uh, what we did is we went in together on, on the molds and, and engineering and cost. And, uh, we weren't able to do it by ourselves. We were too small and didn't have a a pot to piss in or a window to throw it out. So (laughs) just so people understand making a tire is in such an involved process and the molds that go, that are required to do that process are insanely expensive. Is there like, yeah. I mean, it's not a cheap process to say, oh, we're going to make one mold. Like, that's a lot of money. Yeah. And, and, and to make it worse is the original outlaws and, and still a lot of the outlaws to this day, they actually require sand molds. Oh, because they're so, so big? No, because of the tread profiles. Gotcha. You, you can't machine a tread profile with the, with the unique shaping that the outlaw has, uh, where most tires are just put in on a on a cnc and you know they cut the mold out well these literally have to be sand cast molds wow. it's like really old school there's not even a whole lot of companies still doing that right and, especially in uh, the united states yeah yeah and so uh so anyway we we partnered up with gateway and uh we partnered with them for gosh i don't remember how many years it was we we eventually bought our half out from gateway oh wow uh and uh, and stay very close with them to this day. That's a phenomenal company, and uh, that treated us with dignity and respect. Given how big they were, it was really refreshing to work with a company that you know had heart and soul like that. So I still to this day give them major props for helping Highlifter become what it, it's become today. Speaking of working with big companies, at some point you transitioned from being Highlifter to being synonymous with Polaris Off Road. Kind of like, how did that happen? And, and what does that mean for you guys today? Um, I can tell you, uh, Polaris is like Gateway. Our experiences with everybody from the top to the bottom, is just, it's like we're all family. They're part of our family. Yeah, it's almost like we work at the same company, you know, helping each other out. Uh, that relationship really took off in 2008 uh, with a good friend of ours, Craig Scanlon. Uh, uh, was really coming up in the Polaris world. And he had this brilliant idea that, you know, Polaris was going to partner with three or four companies and help them design a line of aftermarket products. So when their unit hit the floor, you know, brand new out of the box, there would be all these accessories available, you know, as, as a marketing leverage tool. Right. And uh, so he came down and, and visited with us. And I guess the rest is history because, it flourished. There was three companies that were selected that first year and, uh, and we're still going strong. So what is that? I mean, how does that change your product development scheme? Like, is it, is it now that you're, you're tied in with a big company like that, that you're kind of focused on what they're focused on, or does it give you just more freedom because you have more ability to invest resources into that development? Uh, interestingly enough, uh, we really focus on the aftermarket and they, really focus on direct to consumer. Um, and so, you know, I can tell you, there's so many aggressive pl- people at Polaris, you know, they would, when I tell you those engineers would love to put out a machine with 38s on it or 44s, <laughs> the fact, I'm telling you, they would love to, you know, but they're, they're, they're constrained a little bit, but because they have to, they have to appeal to the broader market. Right. And so, you know, the, the high lifter edition units that, that they produce, uh, is is the best platform you can get hands down for the mud world. And 
and they design that that architecture in there to be upscaled by the consumer. Um, I tell people to this day, my favorite unit that I've ever owned was a 2016 High Lifter Edition Razor. I never touched it. Not one single performance accessory. You know, I put a roof and a radio and stuff on. No lift kit. Stock 29.5 Outlaw 2s. I mean. He drove the wheels off I of it. I drove the wheels off. It's <laughs> the most fun machine. I drove it for two years. Most fun I ever had. Well, I've seen, Rachel, you had a pretty big machine, right? And then he was riding this I, little I stock always, machine. I always, uh, I've had three large machines yeah. now. I'm on my third. And yeah, I, she always has. I have the big ones. I like to, I like to do that part of it. I like the technical and the off camber and all that. So, but is I, it, is it that or do you just like staying out of the mud? <laughs> no, I, I love the mud. I love the mud, but recently I have discovered I might love the rocks even more. Yeah. Oh, yeah. yeah. So, so rock crawling is our new thing. So I've, you know, been a Northwest boy most of my life. I, I actually was born and raised in Arizona and then moved up to the Northwest. And and so one of my favorite things to do is to get on the trails and then discover new trails or make new trails, uh, which really tests the machine's abilities along with your technical ability uh, to yeah. navigate obstacles, yeah. right? And uh, oh, yeah. so when you were talking a little bit about developing new products and being out West a little bit more, uh, is there any information you can kind of dive into like what you're approaching and how you're looking at developing a new product line around the West, the West side of the country? <laughs> Yeah, so we have a lot of things that work really good out west, like in our existing lineup. Uh, you know, one of the things that we were working on doing, and uh, particularly Rachel has done a really good job kind of helping people out west learn that most of the stuff we do for the mud works beautiful out west. I mean, obviously, they don't need a snorkel. Okay, we get that. Uh, and they don't need to move their radiator, so to speak. But like our control arms and stuff, you know, work well out there already. But we are doing some really fun stuff. You're gonna see. You're gonna see some. Uh, some. Uh, I guess I should say it. Should I say it? Okay. Look, I'm gonna tell you, and I'm gonna get in trouble. I'm telling you right now. Every engineer <laughs> in the building is gonna come whack me on the All head. All right. We're so world exclusive here stuff. from uh, from the Smith family at High Lifter. Yeah, uh, no. Some new stuff coming out uh, that here pretty soon. Oh yeah, I'm gonna get my butt handed to me. But we're doing some long travel stuff. That's what we've been out. Really. West Tip. Testing in glamis yeah. yeah and uh so traditionally you've been yep. like stock oem with or just a little bit wider with portals or something like that and you're looking at yeah. going even wider yeah and it'll be full long travel and that includes front end trailing yes wow so the, so all the guys with those pro xps and and maybe the the turbo s's might be looking for some products coming out soon Maybe. Maybe. <laughs> um, I'm like. <laughs> well, I'm already in trouble. I might as well just say it. Yeah. So, yeah. so there's a lot of, um, how do I say it? There's going to be a lot of movement in our industry here yeah, this year. Um, there's been a lot of rumors going around. We've said a lot of things over on our side, uh, but there's been even more information coming out lately uh, saying that this, this next season is going to be pretty, pretty epic for anybody that enjoys um you know, speed and off-road and, and all that kind of stuff. So, um, you know, when you guys look at kind of how the industry is moving forward, obviously you have your connections with these OEs and, and things like that. And you make products for both Polaris, Can-Am and others. Like what gets you excited at the end of the day to come out with something new? And it's not just another control arm. It's not just another trailing arm. It's not just a lift kit, right? Like what gets you excited when these OEs are working with you? Well, we like all the new stuff, you know, I mean, yeah, control arms and lift kits for bread and butter. Uh, and we always want to be up to date on that stuff. I mean, you know, the fun is in the cutting edge stuff that nobody has done before. And you're, you're working on, on figuring it out and making it do things that it just wasn't supposed to do. And back to what Scott said earlier, um, he, he is famous for being out West riding or up North or wherever he's at, especially out West. And he's like, Whoa, wait a minute. I, I, this would work better. So he brings it back to the team here and, and R&D and, and the engineers and says, this is what I experienced. And, and, and then that new product, you know, kind of prototype goes into place because Scott figured something out or, you know, someone did out there or Jesse or Jesse or some of the people we have helping like Blake, you know, um, and, and it, it he, I mean, he, that's what I think you get the biggest kick out of is when he really, he gets out there and he says, whoa, I've been with him so many times. And he's like, 
I'm going to do this and arch this or do this. And he does it. And it's like, it's, it's a hit. And I'm just like, whoa. So well, the best way to develop new products is to go out and, and experience, right? Mm-hmm. And that's right. where a lot mm-hmm. of companies, you know, fail to to grow is that they get so involved in the logistics of business and the in, in the logistics of being a big brand or a big company um, that they they forget how they how they actually revolutionized their thing, right? Like how they came mm-hmm. in and were able to develop something new and, and better. Uh, it's usually tied to them being outside, right? And so yeah. um, that's I would assume is a core component of your business model. It oh, is. Yeah. And I and I and I will I will say right now, this is a great time to interject this that uh when I tell you it's a team effort at High Lifter, you know, I try not to use the word I uh, because I, I, I I'm telling you, we have engineers and fabricators and that are that are just second to none. And a lot of the stuff we come up with is their original That's right. because they're enthusiasts too, you know. And uh, we all feed off each other, play off each other, challenge each other. So, you know. And sometimes it's, it's parts for fun. Recently, um, I have the big Pro XP jacked up. And recently, Jesse here um, in the shop, he made me a, uh, a it's a spring loaded. I couldn't reach the top of my ice chest. Uh, <laughs> couldn't climb up there. So he made me a spring loaded ladder that um, I can climb up in there now and get in it. And it just goes back up on its own. Oh, it's that's awesome. really cool. Yeah. Is, that, is that the Pro XP that premiered at the dealer show? Yes. Yeah. yeah. Nice. Yeah. But uh, as far as is the ones here, I mean, I, I tell you, it's uh, in the shop. It's it's Jesse and Ricky, and uh, we we got a a new uh, a new worm we're training up, Squiggles. <laughs> and, and, uh, and in engineering, it's my my brother leads the team, Brian and uh, and Charles Singleton, and then we've got engineers. We've got. Joe and, and Corey and Justin and uh, Savannah's a draft. So we, we got a really nice team. And, and I'm telling you what, every one of them deserves equal credit for what we get done. Cause it takes, it takes us all. I think every single employee at high lifter um, is like that. Oh, gosh, we, yeah. we have the best team that possibly imaginable. And it sounds yeah. like you guys, you know, being, Partly a Southern based business, but also just the way that things have built. It sounds like you're a real family based business where it's your, your family's really tied in. And then those that work with you are really becoming close and part of the family, right? Like it's becoming a a, a cohesive unit versus just a workplace. Oh, most definitely. I think everybody here will tell you that it's a family environment. So when you're talking about some of these, um, you know, developing and, and engineering and, and going into these new products, one of the most complicated products I can think of that you even offer is probably like the portal systems, right? Like there's very few manufacturers out there that are in the UTV market saying, hey, here's a portal kit for your car. Mm-hmm. Like how did that, how did you guys approach even making a portal and and where are you at today with your technology with the new products that, that you came out with this last year? Uh, well, the, the portals with us go back all the way to 2000, I believe 14, uh, our involvement. In, in the whole portal program and what that was about. And we had some really challenging experiences early on. Uh, and there came a time where we just kind of took a step back from portals. <clears throat> and then a few years ago, we decided to step back in with a vengeance. And we did. We basically took everything done with a portal and threw it in the trash can and started scratch and uh, started from scratch. And I tell you, we, I, I will put our portal up against, against any portal. It is hands down uh, the strongest portal made, period, in a sentence, second to none. And are you guys doing cast or billet or both? Or forged? We're doing, we're doing forged, which is stronger than either. Gotcha. Yeah. And, and so what kind of like hurdles do you have to overcome coming out with a forged billet or I'm sorry, a forged portal system that is going to last the abuse in the mud and last the abuse and now in the rock scene and, and things like that. What, what goes into that kind of process? Uh, well, a lot of engineering over my head because I'm not an engineer, <laughs> but, the, but the good thing is I know one or right. two or three or four. So, <laughs> um, but I think one of our biggest, our biggest improvements that really leapfrogged us way, way ahead is the dual idler gears. Okay. Um, that is that is a source of failure on most all portals. Generally, when a portal fails and it's not a leak, uh, it's going to be an idler gear. Uh, 
and the dual idler gears just cut that load in half for right? each individual and they just don't break. You know, you may break something, but you're not going to break that. And we've rolled it out in, into our four inch line, our six inch line, uh, and any line that may come in the future will all be dual idlers. Uh, the one caveat is we are going to continue selling the original, uh, original redesigned portal in a four inch, uh, just because it's it's quite a bit less expensive and it's a good entry portal. Gotcha. The price point. Yeah. So you're saying this new generation is kind of the the middle of the high tier port portal, and you'll keep that other one around to have an option for the guy that doesn't want to spend that much money yeah. up front. Yeah, particularly for ATVs. You know, they're not running high horsepower, uh, stuff like that. Um, and it, it's just a good one there. So we have a, a lot of ATV backing plates, fitments that'll be coming out in the next six months. So we're, we've been really weak in that area. So, you know, that's something that, that we want to focus on and gotcha. try to get done. So when we're talking about um, a high quality dual idler portaler, uh, does that, does that equate out to a general purpose portal or is that mostly specific for mud? Because if you think about a mud rider, right, they're going for really hard torquey environments for short amount of times. Whereas someone out West, like, or Northwest, like I am, right. We're doing more of like, we're driving half an hour and then we're off-roading for, you know, an hour and then we're going another hour out further. And then we're having to go all the way back to the truck for another two hour span. Do portals yeah. make sense in that kind of environment or is it more, geared towards um, the lower uh, temperature scenarios where you're not running that hard that fast for that long? It, it, it's both. It really, you know, it all gets down to, you know, if you've got to drive an hour to the next off-roading area, uh, it, it depends on how abusive that off-road area is. I mean, if you really, if it justifies the slower speeds, um, particularly at rock crawling, you know, it's, that's where portals are going to take over in the next five years. I mean, they're already out there. Um, you're going to see them and, you know, rock crawling, anybody who's got experience rock crawling knows how much stuff you tear up. Right. And, uh, and so the portals will prevent a lot of those damages. And then of course it'll get you places where you couldn't go before. So you'll probably break some loose. <laughs> <laughs> so the rocks are definitely less forgiving than the uh, dirt or sand or mud. Right. Um, yeah. But uh, I know we have uh, limited time today, so I wanted to get to uh, some events that are going on. You've transitioned from just being a product set to being a whole lifestyle brand, right, where you've incorporated, you know, a lot of different um, clothing and things like that. But you've also incorporated these events, right? So these events have really taken off and you've grown Mud Nationals into a, an, a staple every year for, for the community that enjoys that type of event. Um, can you kind of explain how that started and what you got coming up? Uh, it started, um, was it 13, 14 years ago? Mm, no, like 18 or 19. 18, years ago. 19 years ago. Sorry about that. <laughs> um, Scott's dad wanted to have a, uh, a rally of all these, which were uh, four wheelers back then, or quads only, uh, riding, and they did it, and it was a complete failure. And Scott said he was never doing it again on the way home from this this park and it's riding a lot of work. park. And <laughs> As he was driving home, he said that he just kept thinking of ways that he could make this better and how he could make it work. And that's where it started. And over the last 18 years, we have grown into the largest um, party in the South. And I think we were the first ones to do this type of large event um, for the off-road community anyway, with the level we have. Um, this year will be absolutely amazing. We, we have... Um, Pro, right? We've got Ronnie Anderson and RJ Anderson coming out. Ronnie's going to race the short course. There's some other OEM pro, uh, pro racers in, in there. The mud? Uh, no, no they'll be on short course. Oh, you're adding short course. Okay. Gotcha. Yeah, and we had we've had it, but this year it's uh the Cross X series, and um, so Ronnie will be down running that along, like I said, with other pro OEM drivers. Um, Blake Vanderloo's coming down. He won KOH. Yep. We've nice. got um. Hopefully you know, the Jagged X guys will be down. They're yeah. not sure if they can uh, make it. Brandon Sims. Um, so we've got so many people out West coming. We've got um, Maddie Watkin, which um, she's also team high lifter. Uh, we've got RJ, Ronnie, Maddie, four by four Barbie, Brandon Sims, Craig Scanlon, you know, just these 
uh, Jagged X, Bill and Brandon, all these people that we just, that now our team high lifter that we work together with, and they're all just caravanning out West. I mean, out South. Yeah. So um, it should be a pretty good, this, pretty good event. Yeah. Along with like, um, we've even got PRP seats, pro armor coming, um, assault, assault, uh, shock therapy, shock therapy, HCR, uh, so, so the, the Ford the, Motor Company. <laughs> yeah, yeah. This will be the biggest mud nationals we've ever had. We have drag racing, um, not mud, but not uh, dry. It's real sloppy. We have um, Bounty Hole. Um, we have a lot of events. Show and Shine, that Renegade is sponsoring. Um, just a lot. Um, Claris is really bringing it to the table this year. Just they do every year, but we just got a lot. Um, it's going to be huge. It's going to be like getting to the Super Bowl. That's awesome. So you guys typically have, you know, thousands upon thousands of people show up at this and, and it's a participatory event, right? You can get in there, you can race, you can participate in uh, the glory that is mud. And uh, yeah. it seems like a really good time for the whole family. Uh, yeah. And then you can also ride, you know, you know, just tons and tons of miles of, of muddy trails and semi dry trails. So, you know, whether you want to participate or watch or just a competition ride. or just spend time riding with the family or friends. You know, you can do some of all of it. We kick that off with a poker run and a concert every night. So that that actually part that happens at your facility, right? Your high lifter proving grounds. No, but no. it's at a venue called Hillarosa ATV Park in Blevins, Arkansas. Okay. This year, so um, and that's where it was. Well, not last year because of COVID, but the year before also. We were in Texas. We moved to Arkansas. I'm pretty happy with it. Now, so, um, and we're also going to ERX um, in Elk City in Minneapolis, St. Paul for a full five day event, June the 9th through the 13th. Um, so that's going to be really fun and different. Um, we've done an event in Minnesota. We just kind of wanted to bring some new action to it. So we partnered with ERX and um, hope, hopefully, like I said, some pop up events, you'll see us out west. That's awesome. So uh, this, uh, this next year is not only a big year for new product, but also for getting out and doing new events and new meeting new people and new communities that haven't traditionally been a part of the high lifter event series. Right. Right. Awesome. We've well, even got um, Miss high lifter competition just to kind of zoom in. That's a spokeswoman for the company. <laughs> and uh, we've even got some um, uh, contestants from out West that have joined to try to win that. So, and That's we've awesome. got them from Florida all the way to Minnesota. So, well, I know we have a uh, limited time here for you guys to get back to their daily day logistics of running a big company. Um, but uh, just want to give you an opportunity. Uh, where can we find you online? Where can we expect to find uh, videos, photos, all that kind of stuff? Where can we see what you're doing? And where can we find those new products uh, that you're going to be announcing? Okay, I'm um, always social media and www.highlifter.com and the events you can find at www.highlifterevents.com. You can find us on Twitter, Instagram, Facebook, uh, and we're also getting our YouTube, um, uh, but it's not quite up and ready yet <laughs> working on that one. <laughs> Okay. So it uh, looks like you guys have a lot on your plate and uh, you have a big team behind you to make this all all happen this year. And I look forward to seeing this new product series come out for uh, for us Western type guys and uh, maybe see uh, what you guys have in store that maybe hasn't been announced yet. So um, look forward to it and uh, excited to have you guys on the show. Hope you had a good time. And I hope that uh, this season, a lot of people are looking at your products and looking at what you have to offer. Yeah, we've had a ball. We've Thank had a ball you. chatting with you. And yeah. uh, thank you. Not a problem. Now come to our nationals. Hey, that sounds like a good <laughs> idea to me. All right, guys. Until the next time, peace. Peace.